Have you ever heard that someday the temple would be rebuilt and then Messiah would return? Stick around, because today on Back to Our Roots, we're going to be talking about exactly that. Welcome to Back to Our Roots. I'm Pastor Alex Schessler. And I'm Rachel Hyman, Minister of Music. And we welcome you to our program today. Today, we are going to be dealing with a very controversial topic amongst not just believers, but even non-believers. And it's, it's the idea of, of will a literal, physical temple be rebuilt in Jerusalem at some point before Messiah returns. Mm -hmm. um, Rachel, I, I don't know if you've ever heard people talking about this, but I know that this is a, a real hot topic. Have you ever run into that with anyone? That yeah, discussion? probably the most awkward thing I hear is that, you know, Jesus can't return until all the Jews return to Jerusalem and after the temple has been rebuilt. And um, that's been interesting. And I've even re received some personal criticism for being Jewish and staying in America. <laughs> Well, I, I'm Jewish too, but I haven't had anyone say that. But I have heard that. We're going to talk about that view because um, there are several different concepts, ideas, and views mm -hmm. about the timing. Before we get into that, I, I wanted to take us just a little bit through kind of the history of, of how the temple came to be from a biblical perspective. You know, we have to go back to the book of Exodus and, and the children of Israel. They've, they've made their way and they're wandering through the desert. And, and it's God who has this desire and he speaks to Moses and, and tells Moses, look, I want you to build me a dwelling place. Mm. I, I want to have a place that I will be able to dwell in the midst of my people, um, which is, you know, such a beautiful it thing. Is. You know, God, God always has this desire to want to be with us, to dwell with us. So the scriptures tells us that God specifically gave Moses a pattern um, and, and, it, and it's patterned after a, a heavenly tabernacle, a, a heavenly temple that exists, and, and told Moses with great detail. If, if you go into the book of Exodus, um, book of Numbers, there's, there's beautiful descriptions of all the things that God did, um, and, and very particular, all the ornamentation of the, of the Mishkan, which is the tabernacle in the wilderness in Hebrew, the Mishkan, and um, how God stayed with them. And, and as we progress through the Torah, through the Bible, remember the Torah is the first five books of, of the Bible. Um, as we progress through this, um, we, we eventually make our way to the time of David, um, the psalmist, David the king. And David, scripture tells us, gets a passion in his heart that he wants to build a permanent place where God's presence can dwell in the midst of the people. Because prior to that, it's, it's the tent. You know, and I think maybe David's looking around at all the other great civilizations and maybe he's got some jealousy for his God, hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, th there's always been that tendency, you know, my God's bigger than your God, mm -hmm. I don't know. So David gets in his heart to do it and, and God speaks to David and says, you know what, David, your heart is great that you want to do this, but you're not going to be able to do it because you're a man of war. Hmm. But David, your son, Solomon, I will use him. And of course we know that, that Solomon brought all of the resources together and built this beautiful um, temple, sanctuary um, for God. Which, by the way, I think in, in, in other programs we may delve deeper into everything that has to do with that, but not in this particular program. Um, then, unfortunately, as happens so often, um, the, the, the Hebrews are judged um, for so many reasons, and God uses Babylon to judge them. And this beautiful temple that was built by Solomon is destroyed, mm. and the Jews are put in captivity. And it's, it's a period of time that they spend there in captivity, and then finally God moves upon Babylon, upon the hearts of the king and, 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 the, and the leaders there, and the Jews begin the process through Ezra and Nehemiah to head back and to start rebuilding the, uh, the temple. Mm -hmm. And they do rebuild it, but it's never quite like it was until we get right around that first century period, um, the time of, of Herod, King Herod the Great, um, and he really goes over the top. And, and that's why that temple, um, which is the second temple, is known as Herod's Temple. And this is the, the temple that existed 
in the time that Jesus walked the earth and, and all the narratives and all the stories that we see in the Gospels really center around mm. that temple. Um, and then, of course, once again, there is judgment that takes place. And in 70 AD, Rome completely destroys the temple. And not very short after that, the Jews are all banished from Jerusalem. Um, and it's really not until modern history that they're able to return and, and you know, Israel as a country is established. And we still have the Temple Mount, the place that, that many people see pictures of. And we see the Jews uh, against what's known as the Western Wall. And this is, was actually or is actually the, the outside retaining wall uh, of, of the Temple Mount. Um, there's lots of controversy exactly where the temple itself existed um, during the time. Uh, and, and again, we're not going to go really deep into that. But um, at this point, I, I'd love to uh, bring out our scholar, um, Alexander Bolitnikov. He's been with us on our shows. Um, we know him as Sasha. Uh, brother, why don't you come on out and join us? Because uh, Sasha will, will add a, a, a whole other level of depth. Um, to our discussion. Good to see you, Alex, yeah. Rachel. Hey, Good to Sasha. see you, Sasha. Good to have you once again. Sasha, uh, today we're talking about this idea of the temple um, and, and the, the possibility or the probability that, that many people think someday in the future the temple is going to be rebuilt. And you know, from there, it, it's very interesting that there's, from a Jewish perspective and, and from a Christian perspective, you know, there's, there's a lot of divergence. I know that the, the Orthodox Jews believe that for the temple to be rebuilt, that Messiah has to come back first, which is exactly the opposite of a large part of Christianity, correct? Exactly. Uh, uh, the difference between, uh, and, and many Christians do not realize this, that there is a totally different uh, mindset among, in Judaism regarding the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, in fact, uh, the person who actually developed this uh, whole idea uh, in Judaism. His name was in the European style Moses Maimonides. Okay. Uh, he lived in the 12th century, 11th, 12th century. Very famous scholar, philosopher. He was the one who actually presented this idea that there has to be a war going on between Israel and Arabs. And he was actually talking, encouraging Jewish community, which at this time was scattered across that e Jews will be able to gather back to, uh, uh, to Israel, to the promised land, and then there will be a great war. And as a climax of this war, Messiah shall come and he shall set his foot on the top of this uh, golden dome on the rock. And this uh, golden dome will evaporate and the temple, and he will rebuild the temple as an act of miracle. Wow. So, okay, um, is there, a, did, he, did he get these ideas from scripture? Um, was there any scriptural, you know, basis uh, behind my, it? Maimonides doesn't have, there is no literally scriptural foundation for this. Uh, and often these words, especially in uh, today's uh, ultra-Orthodox Judaism, they are considered as prophetic. Okay. In fact, there are some ultra-Orthodox Jews who are so dead set against the current state of Israel just because they believe that until Messiah comes, they, it cannot happen. Wow, interesting, interesting. So, Sasha, let's, let's talk about what the Bible does have to say about whether there will be a rebuilding of the temple or not. Um, I know that there are some specific things. Um, uh, Ezra uh, has, has things that he says prophetically that seem to talk about the temple. Um, what can you tell us about that? Well, the, the largest uh, piece of information that talks about rebuilding of the temple uh, is found in the book of Ezekiel. This is a very, very large, uh, magnificent prophecy uh, that spans from uh, Ezekiel chapter 40 to uh, the end of the book, chapter 48. And it takes time and effort to actually read through this because Ezekiel literally documents his vision. And uh, Ezekiel is a prophet of Babylonian captivity. The people are there in Babylonian captivity. Uh, and uh, basically, 
uh, Ezekiel is taken in his vision uh, to the destroyed Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and he is led by a heavenly being, uh, an angel who has a measuring rod, and basically this heavenly being measures the dimensions of the future temple. So like three, four chapters, it's uh, meticulous details about uh, which basically outline the blueprint of the future temple. So what, what temple is this prophecy speaking about? I guess that's the big question. Yeah, that's the big question. And uh, there is lots of discussion about this because uh, uh, first of all, this temple uh, is way, way much bigger than the one which we know as a Herod's temple. Okay. Uh, one, one other, and, and, and that's why many Christians who read this, they believe that there will be another temple after the destruction of Herod's temple in this 70 is, AD. This is that idea of a third temple that will be rebuilt. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the source. Well, there is another source. We may talk about this later in f the letter of Thessalonians, but it's a little bit different issue. But uh, the main source uh, of the Old Testament prophecies is taken from that uh, large prophecy because they see that such a huge temple was never built. But for Christian to think that there will be a rebuilt temple, it will present a, a major problem. Right. If you compare uh, the size of the altar, they, they have this dimensions of the altar, which is going to be in the new temple. This is huge altar, it's like, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 10 by 10 by 10 feet. This is huge. Uh, the, the original was uh, like, uh, no, the 12 by 12 feet. The original was uh, uh, basically 6 by 6 by 6 feet. So it was much, much smaller in dimension. So, and, and then it goes into all the ordinances of sacrifices. Right, which that in itself presents a huge problem. Yeah, for you know, Christians. Th this, this is something that, Rachel, that I've never been understand, you know, from, from many areas within Christianity, and they start talking this whole idea that, yes, the temple has to be rebuilt, mm -hmm. and that sacrifice will be reestablished. Um, uh, right wow. away, my mind goes to, okay, so how does, this, how does this coincide with the idea that Messiah is the perfect lamb, the once and for exactly. all sacrifice, the things like in Hebrews, how it talks about that. This is the perfect sacrifice that it, it never has to be done again. So why, why would there be any need for the sacrificial system to be reinitiated again? And such a magnificent sacrificial system. What will these lambs and all this sacrifice symbolize if Jesus exactly. is already alive? And, and, and we know that epistle of Hebrews talks about him being a high priest in heaven. Right. And even today, in, among the Jews who are actually also planning to rebuild the temple, but in a little different way, I have to note it, that there is, there is a, there is a institute, it's yes. called uh, right. Mahon HaMikdash. Uh, the, right. the Temple Institute. The Temple Institute. Yeah, I've heard of that. And uh, I always take uh, the tour groups to this institute and have my, my friend, director of this institute, always likes to talk about this. And, and he uses the phrase, as soon as we get permission. <laughs> and that shows the difference. See, there are many uh, Christians and preachers I see who instigate Jews to actually attack the Palestinians and fight. But let it be known to Christians that Orthodox Jews are, are not going to go up to the Temple Mountain. They are waiting for the Messiah to, to come actually first. come first and clear this place up. You know, it's interesting you wow. bring that up. You know, I, I've, I've been over there as well, and they've gone to the pains to build this giant menorah mm -hmm. and, and all the, the articles that, that the priests would use, and they have the, the costume for the high priest made, and and, and the, 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 the banner that he wore across his head, Kadosh la Adonai, holy to the Lord. Yes. I mean, I've seen all of that stuff, and they really... They're ready. Uh, they're ready. They think that this is going to happen. And, and, you know, and, and again, the, even just the logistics that this could even happen, um, it, it's more probable that the Orthodox Jewish view that Messiah would come and evaporate the dome, you know, 
Because for, for, for that to, to be destroyed or be to move, can you imagine um, what the Middle East would look like as far as the war mm -hmm. and the things that would happen just when, when, they, when they've tried to go up there? Um, all, all kinds of things have happened. And, and, and the problem is, actually, they had an opportunity. Remember 1967 war. Right. Mashed Dayan was on the top of a temple mount. He completely had this uh, area under control, and he specifically consulted with the government, asking, should we blow it up? Is this our chance? And the government, of course, contacted Rabin out of Israel. And the Rabin out of Israel said... Which is, that's the rabbis, the group of rabbis. Yeah, and they said, no way you're going to do it. Because right. they knew what is going to happen. First of all, they, they understand that by their own hands, they cannot do it. Because right by the wall there, there are graves on, upon... A, there is a gr the big cemetery. Right. So you start tearing this thing down, you will end up in contact with dead bones. Y you buy a lot by of that goes against Jewish law. Exactly. By Levitical law, you make yourself unclean, so you build, uh, you build a temple which is inherently unclean to begin with. Mm -hmm. They understood it perfectly. That's why they're not even trying to do anything until Messiah comes. Right. Which I, uh, which I think becomes a, and is the, the greatest part of this is getting getting the concept of the order of how the Bible speaks about what things are going to happen when. Um, well, but coming back to the prophecy of Ezekiel, yes. and, and that's very substantial to understand, that it is not only a blueprint of the temple, but what happens next. Because uh, when it goes all the way to chapter 46 and 47, we have... A, a, a change of topic from the blueprint and from the ordinances of sacrifice we go into the description of the transformation of the land and you see that the Ezekiel is uh, seen that outside of the temple fr right from the most holy right from uh, from uh, underneath the ark there is a little stream that flows down and it flows out of the temple and Ezekiel uh, is uh, led in the vision uh, by the stream, and he sees that the stream gets deeper and deeper and deeper, and goes all down the stream, down to the Jericho, through Judean desert. And Ezekiel describes how Judean desert turns into a blooming garden. And then it flows straight into the Dead Sea. And if uh, you, Alex, uh, been at the Dead Sea, you probably haven't seen any single living organism. No, of course not. There's <laughs> nothing. That's why it's called dead. <laughs> yeah, because there's so much salt, and there's, you know, it's uh, the result of Sodom and Gomorrah and, judging. And you, know, you know what's a, an amazing thing uh, about the Dead Sea, not to, to cut you, but I know the first time that I was there, and, and you ride the road that's heading down, and you see it. And, and let me tell you, it is the most beautiful-looking body of water. It's got this amazing color of blue, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. And, 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 and then when you get up to it, first of all, the stink is unbelievable because the, the salt and the sulfur, mm -hmm. I mean, you get, you get out of the tour bus and start making your way there, and it's like, what is that smell? And then you get down, and let, you know, you, you've seen pictures of people floating the salinity is so high, and of course, there's nothing living in the water. And yeah. to me, that's one of those great ironies, something that looks so beautiful, yet is completely dead. But in the mm. prophecy of Ezekiel, wow. the water from that stream enters the Dead Sea and makes it livable. It, yeah. it desalinates. And it ends up with this vision that he sees in, in, in the area of Engadi all the way down to the south. Fishermen fishing the fish there. <laughs> So you can see that this uh, was a great plan that God had for people of Israel after their return from Babylon. So is that, that's what the idea was and that's what this process Yeah, we've was. talked about the Old Covenant, how the temple, how the land of Israel was supposed to become center of the entire, I would say in Christian uh, lingo, preaching of the gospel across the world. Right. Israel was supposed to be an example 
for all people to follow so that everybody, according to Isaiah, would go up to the mountain of the Lord so that from Zion the Torah would come. So God had this, God was given to the people of Israel this chance. After all these troubles of idolatry they went to, through, you know, come back, come clean, and he would again bless the nation so that they would become that model country for the entire world. And, and, and there in the midst is this picture that Ezekiel has of this temple. Exactly. That provides this rivers of living water and so on. The only problem was <clears throat> that it required unity. Hmm. Everyone was supposed to live the Babylon and go to Jerusalem and start working. But you know, in the book of Ezra, there is an episode when they laid the foundation of the temple. Mm -hmm. The older people who were there, when saw the Solomon temple, they start weeping because it's just so small. In mm -hmm. comparison to what? Yeah. Because well, and, 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 such know, a small number actually left the comforts right. See, of I think that's, that's a thing that a lot of people don't realize also is that when, when, uh, when the Hebrews, when the Jews left Babylon, there was a large percentage that didn't leave because they were comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and wow, you know, that, that again paints such a picture for us. Yes. You know, how so many people, they don't want to come out of the world. They don't want to come out of Babylon and, and go to where God has for them, which God was promising to them this beautiful place with this, this beautiful temple with the waters that would turn the Dead Sea alive and, and all of this, yet Amazing. they remained... Um, where it was comfortable. Because of a lack of faith. Yeah. Well, but on and, the and comfort. Yeah, but on the other hand, <clears throat> the prophecy is being fulfilled. Mm. And it's a little modified. That's where the new covenant comes. And the new covenant is not only making a centralized country of Israel. New covenant through salvation, which uh, is offered uh, on Calvary, provides the transformation not only a Dead Sea and Judean desert, but the entire world. Exactly. A new heaven and a new earth. So John, the revelator, sees the river, the same as Ezekiel, and, upon, and on the, both sides of the river there are, there are uh, trees that provide fruits for food and for medicine. He sees the same thing, but he sees it on a scale of entire world, not on a scale of only one small country. Well, wow. God's plan is always so much better. Right. And, and it, you know, it's, it's such a shame that people take this idea of God's plan being so much bigger and have to distill it down to see it the way, you know, yeah. in such a limited, because really when you're thinking about, okay, they're going to build some kind of reestablished temple on the physical, on the Temple Mount, as opposed to what you're describing, it is once again, it's, it's humankind putting God in a box, limiting, and not seeing how huge God, what he really is going to do. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're getting close now uh, to, to ending it. And, and I, I want to just, the last thing here, again, you know, is, is Sasha, <laughs> does there really need to be a, a, a new physical temple rebuilt? Absolutely not. Yeah. We have a high priest, our Lord Yeshua, Jesus, who is now ministering in a great heavenly temple that right. cannot, is not susceptible to destruction. Right. Rachel, I know you have another wonderful song for us today. Why don't you go over and get ready? And Rachel's going to be singing a song all about Miriam and how as the children of Israel had made their way through the Red Sea, Miriam led the women as they danced and they praised. Miriam danced. And the women dancing with the timbrels followed Miriam as she sang her song. Sing a song to the one whom we've exalted. Miriam and the women danced and danced the whole night long. 
And Miriam was a weaver of unique variety. The tapestry she wove was one which sang our history. With every strand and every thread, she crafted her delight. A woman touched with spirit, she dances toward the light. And the women dancing with their timbrels followed Miriam as she sang her song. Sing a song to the one whom we exalted. Miriam and the women dancing, dance the whole night long. When Miriam stood upon the shores and gazed across the sea, the wonder of this miracle she soon came to believe. Whoever thought the sea would part with an outstretched hand, and we would pass to freedom and march to the promised land. And the women dancing with their timbrels followed Miriam as she sang her song. Sing a song to the one whom we Exalted, Muriel and the women danced and danced the whole night long. And Miriam, the prophet, took her timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her just as she had planned. And Miriam raised her voice in song, she sang with praise and might. We've just lived through a miracle, we're going to dance tonight. And the women dancing with their timbrels fall. Dancing, dance the whole night long. And the women dancing with their timbrels followed Miriam as she sang her song. Sing a song to the one whom we've exalted. Miriam and the women dancing, dance the whole night long. Miriam and the women dancing, dance the whole night long. Amen. Rachel, what a great song. God is good. Amen. Amen. Martine, thank you once again for joining us. Um, it's been a, a wonderful program today. Uh, uh, you know, I want to recommend to those of you watching that the next time someone comes up and says, what do you think about the temple being rebuilt? You just look them right in the eye and say, the temple will not be rebuilt because our Messiah is the perfect lamb and we don't need the sacrificial system again. So we look forward to having you join us. Um, our, our next program is going to be all about the Shabbat. It's going to be exciting. Mm -hmm. Rachel, thank you so much for, for being with me um, once again. It's always a joy. Sasha, Martine, again, thank you so much. And may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you his peace. Yivarechecha Adonai, vayishmarecha, yair Adonai, panavelecha v'funecha, yisa Adonai, panavelecha, la shalom. Bless you, shalom. Shalom.